Good evening, and thank you all for joining us for our panel tonight, The Legacy of the Trump Years. I'm Steve Clemensic, the Managing Director and Partner at Berkeley Research Group, where I lead BRG's practice centered on the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, also known as CIP. Intelligence Agency, which also included supporting CFIUS for the Department of Defense. After retiring, I stayed in the intelligence community for about 10 years, and most of it was spent at the National Intelligence Council, uh, working on CFIUS matters there. Following that, I went to the commercial side and stood up CFIUS practices at PwC, and then in Anchor Consulting, and now at BRG. So we begin this evening with the fundamental question, what is President Trump's legacy? Arguably the most polarizing president in recent history, President Trump's impact on areas such as domestic policy, foreign policy, politics and elections, and the Republican Party will be felt for many years to come. Some even going so far as to say decades to come. Whether you agreed with him or not, he was, in a word, consequential, ranging from stolen elections and the big lie to re-energizing the Quad and standing up to China, from enabling white supremacy movements to revamping the space program and from a failed pandemic response to ordering and enabling Operation Warp Speed, described as the Manhattan Project of COVID vaccine development. He was highly divisive in some areas, yet very successful in others. While being out of office only two months, historians and political scientists are already trying to define his legacy. The task can, unlike many presidential legacies, evoke strong emotions, both pro and con. It will be a challenge for many to maintain an objective balance. I offer a sampling of opinions pulled from various media sources. Jonathan Kirshner from Boston College on his foreign policy. Different, short-sighted, transactional, mercurial, untrustworthy, boorish, personalist, and profoundly illiberal in erratic rhetoric, disposition, and creed. Matthew Continenti from the American Enterprise Institute. When Americans write about his presidency, they will do it through the lens of the riot. They will focus on his tortured relationship with the alt-right, his atrocious handling of the deadly Charlottesville protest in 2017, the rise of violent right-wing extremism during his tenure in office, and viral spread of malevolent conspiracy theories that he encouraged. Catherine Brown from Purdue, Purdue University. Broadly speaking, Donald Trump and his enablers in the Republican Party and conservative media have put American democracy to the test in an unprecedented way. It is truly striking the ways in which he has convinced millions of people that his fabricated version of events is true. Mary Frances Berry from the University of Pennsylvania. In what he did with judges, Trump has made a long-lasting change over the next 20 years, 30 years, in how policies will stand up to legal tests and how they're able to be implemented, no matter what any particular president or administration proposes. And finally, Margaret O'Meara of the University of Washington. Trump is a manifestation of political forces that have been in motion for half a century or more a culmination of what was not only going on in the Republican Party, but also in the Democratic Party, and more broadly in American politics, a kind of disillusionment with government and institutions and expertise. She went on, Trump may go away, but there is great frustration with the establishment broadly defined. When you feel powerless, you vote for someone who's promising to do everything differently, and Trump indeed did that. Now, please let me turn to the experts we have with us. I'm honored to share the panel this evening with this distinguished and accomplished group of individuals, including former U.S. Ambassador to India, Frank Wisner, former U.S. Ambassador to the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, Jim Gilmore, Maya McGinnis, who is president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, Gunjan Sina, founder and executive chairman of Metric Stream, and Professor Joseph Nye, Harvard University Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus and former Dean of Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He was recently ranked as the most influential scholar on American foreign policy and is the author of the recently published book, Do Morals Matter? Presidents and Foreign Policy from FDR to Trump. I'll go around the group and allow the panelists to introduce you themselves and offer their perspective on the legacy of the Trump years. Ambassador Wisner. Steve, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you. I assume my voice is carrying, and if it is, uh, to tell you that it's a pleasure to be with Horace's many guests tonight and to address the question of the Trump legacy. Uh, you can look at it from a number of directions. I was no fan of the former presidents and a critic of his foreign policy, but I 
state without fear of contradiction that the legacy he left in our relationship with India is a positive one. And it operated at four levels. The first, he was able to pick up with Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, a personal relationship starting in Washington, continuing to Houston, ending in Ahmedabad and Delhi. The two men came together and created, if you will, an umbrella over the relationship that permitted a lot more to happen. Second, the uh, two governments worked hand in glove in expanding, deepening defense cooperation. Military exercises, technology exchanges, agreements were reached that had been long sought in the field of high tech transfer. Uh, the overall context of the defense relationship emerged from the Trump years stronger. Third, there is a more problematical area in the field of trade. Uh, Trump drew a strong line with India that there had to be an equilibrium in trade between the United States and India. He cut back on <clears throat> a long-standing program of privileged access to the American market, and his administration came to an end with a number of trade disputes unresolved. But overall, during his time in office, the United States investment in India continued to rise and United States trade and commerce with India continued to rise. The fourth and final aspect that I'd want to touch on is the geopolitical aspect. And here, I believe the Trump legacy was both positive and it is clearly enduring. Uh, Trump gave new meaning to the word Indo-Pacific including India specifically, in our conception of our defense, political, economic ties to the Pacific area. Driven by the rise of Chinese power and India's concerns over China, the two sides came together and expanded our cooperation in a manner that was extremely useful, bringing to, to bear <clears throat> two other nations, uh, the Japanese and the Australians, in a quad. The, the Quad uh, brings these together, brings four countries together in a concerted political signal to China that we stand in opposition to any Chinese excesses that might occur. Occasionally, there have been joint military exercises, particularly in the South China Sea. But the political uh, <clears throat> coordination that has resulted is noteworthy. I say that because the Biden administration has picked up very sharply just where Trump left off. Joe Biden, several days ago, met with the Prime Minister of Australia, the Prime Minister of Japan, and Prime Minister Modi to send also an explicit signal to China and to pledge deepened cooperation and a broader base of cooperation. So I believe as a key armament in our uh, determined effort to uh, signal to China that China must play by rules we can all live with, the Quad will be probably the most enduring and geostrategically significant legacy of the Trump years. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Gilmore. Well, I'm Jim Gilmore. I'm the former governor of Virginia and the uh, ambassador, former ambassador to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe that meets in Vienna, Austria. It's a multinational organization, very similar to the United Nations. It has about everybody in it, uh, the Canadians and the Americans, everybody in Europe, the Baltics, Turkey, Russia, Ukraine, even goes out into Central Asia. It's dedicated to a variety of standards, which basically are Western. And in this uh, crisis moment, uh, it's a very important communications and diplomatic tool that meets around the clock. Uh, I think that maybe I, I, I know how short a time I have, so I want to say a few things very quickly. First, uh, I think that the, uh, the way that, that President Trump talked and dealt with people, particularly in the international field in Europe, was very jarring, uh, particularly to people who are foreign policy professionals, if you will, or aficionados in, in America. 
But my experience in politics is that you don't create any change politely. Uh, you don't play nice all the time uh, with people and, uh, and live up to their expectations if you're going to make a change. And I think that, that uh, the president was very, very jarring, and I think he was intending to be so, and he was intending to create change. And I think that that change is going to be an interior legacy of the, of the Trump administration. However, if you really look at the policy the United States was following, that I was following in Vienna, with all of these various countries, all 57 countries in the OSCE, we certainly stood by the touchstone, touchstone of the national security strategy. While a lot of commentators have said, well, the President Trump didn't want to engage in multinational organizations. I was engaged in the multinational organization on behalf of the United States, on behalf of the president. There is a quad in Europe, too, the French, the Germans, the Americans and, and uh, the British. And with all the difficulties and instabilities that we're seeing in Europe, that was a group that worked very, very well together. We worked well with a, pro, with a, a chairman from the Balkans. We worked well with a chairman from the Scandinavian countries. So uh, this actually was going on. But the question, I guess, in the short time I have is, what are the changes and are they really lasting? Well, number one, President Trump has completely transformed American foreign policy towards China. Frank has uh, referred to the Indian initiative. Well, it was necessary. But a lot of times, uh, for the number of years, it wasn't seen as necessary. Uh, China was seen as just sort of a friendly competitor. The truth is that China is an adversary, and they behave like an adversary, both in trade and military, and they do threaten their neighbors. Furthermore, in my personal opinion, they're guilty of crimes against humanity, not only against the Uyghurs, but against their entire population. Trump changed that view of the United States towards China, and I believe it will be lasting. Secondly, Iran. I, for one, am puzzled as to how we can be in, an, in a, uh, a, a nuclear program agreement that has a sunset clause, which means that when that sunset occurs, Iran is able to say with complete legitimacy they can go forward and create a nuclear weapon. If that happens, that makes a conflict in the Middle East inevitable. That can't be allowed to happen. But as of right now, if Iran were able to just simply move forward at the time of the sunset clauses, I, I think there's a very great likelihood that more than one country will actually strike Iran and put us in a terrible position. I think at this point, by pulling out of that agreement, Donald Trump has put Iran on notice that they can't just simply look forward to a day when legitimacy is attached to them. My most great focus at the OSCE was on Russia. There's a lot of talk around the United States about how Donald Trump was in bed with the Russians and interference and all that kind of thing. I can assure you that one of our principal missions at the OSCE was to restrain Russian imperialism. We stood strongly by Ukraine, which, by the way, President, -elect President Biden is not. We stood strongly behind them because the Russians had to know we were strongly behind them. We sent them military support so that the Russians couldn't simply roll back over them again. On the Crimea, we have never agreed to the conquest of Crimea through military means and the breaking of all the rules in Europe on that. Uh, so our position was very, very strong. And then finally on allies, my policy and our policy of the United States was to support our allies and to work with our allies very strongly, but to say to them, you kids simply can't be free riders. If you're free riders, it is not a financial matter. Free riders are sending a political message to our potential adversary that they're not committed. Well, following that kind of pattern, I insisted as ambassador of the OSCE that our allies and friends participate with us in financial and other political matters, and they did. And it was, it was a change of their policy in many cases. And that was largely because President Trump had made that point. These are fundamental, fundamental changes in the approach of foreign policy. It couldn't be done gently. It had to be done aggressively. And I think that uh, the, the final touchstone I will say is his position was America's sovereignty. Well, I want to report to you all that of the 57 countries in the OSCE, all of them adhere to their national interest securities, all of them, their national interests doesn't mean you can't ally with your allies and work together with people in partnership to affect the national interest. We can and we did under the national security strategy and under the Trump foreign policy. But fundamentally, the tone changed. And I think that's going to be an enduring legacy unless President Biden reverses everything, in which case I, I don't know what, what's going to happen. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maya. 
Great, thank you. Good to be with you. I'm Maya McGinnis. I run the uh, nonpartisan committee for a responsible federal budget and a project related to that called Fix Us, which is focusing on how we got to this moment of devastating division and distrust and dysfunction. Um, okay, so I focus on f fiscal policy. And I would say if there are so many things that characterize the, the Trump presidency and his legacy, but one of them certainly related to fiscal policy was his rejection of doing absolutely anything difficult. Uh, and that is also related, I would say, to what ended up being very short-term focused fiscal policy, which I think is something we will see beyond this era. And let me just say, this is putting the COVID year aside. We've borrowed $4 trillion, now $6 trillion to deal with COVID, which is completely appropriate It's when you should be borrowing. But I'm focusing more on the three years building up to that. When the when the president when President Trump ran for president, he actually promised to pay off the national debt in eight years, um, something that would have been spectacularly unwise, but it's nonetheless what he put out there. But instead, what he did was he dramatically cut taxes under the promise they would pay for themselves, which was never true and proved not to be true. He raised spending in every single area of the budget, and he kept his promise not to do anything to deal with our pension and health care programs, which are headed towards insolvency. So all this ultimately increased the national debt by $4 trillion at a time when the economy was growing quite quickly. Um, one of the legacies it probably did was that it moved us from talking about billions to trillions. It also left the debt relative to GDP twice as high when we entered this crisis as it was in the previous crisis because of all that, that run up in the debt. There are other norm shifters in fiscal policy that are continuing to have effect today. I think um, he really mastered the art of the giveaway and uh, you'll recall he wanted to put his names on checks that were sent. And he launched this new model, which I think we're going to see much more of, which is sending money directly pe to people, not even in the form of tax cuts, but in checks, which we just saw in this last bill, which is creating a huge new constituency and potential political support for people who are sending out that money. We can talk more about it, but I think that's going to have lasting effects in terms of what the government does in terms of consumption versus investment, uh, going in the wrong direction because I think investment is so important. Like I said, he focused on the short term um, where the effects of, he, ha he had this boom, this kind of sugar high of an economy that resulted from two trillion in tax cuts and another two trillion in spending increases that would probably have lasted about 18 months or so not for COVID, um, but then would leave us worse off for the long term. And I think we're going to see more of that in the short term where people are going to be trying to time their economic booms to the political cycles even more. Um, and finally, he left the country even more polarized than it was before, and it was polarized before. And that means many things that will make dealing with these fiscal challenges incredibly difficult um, because it leaves the two parties which are dueling it out for what they see as, as an existential cause of having the majority for the next time. And it leaves them unwilling to focus on policy over politics or the long term over the immediate, um, which are all necessary to deal with fiscal challenges. It makes them unwilling to confront trade-offs, which is the key notion of budgeting, and it makes them unwilling to compromise. All of these are the things we need to get the fiscal house back in order. Um, and I fear that we'll look back and see that this may well have been the era that truly broke fiscal policy in that... Um, there's not a window really to deal with these challenges anymore in a timely fashion because of the aging of the population and the slowdown in economic growth. Um, and the main thing is to keep in mind that fiscal policy is really the underpinning of our economic strength. And therefore it leaves us vulnerable to economic shifts, um, interchanges in interest rates, inflation, currency. It leaves us vulnerable to the global situation, which we've already touched upon, but our dependency on borrowing from abroad and our competition to China and with other nations greatly affected by our position of fiscal weakness. Um, and it leaves us unprepared to deal with the techn technological shifts in our economy, the changing nature of work um, and the need for a revised social contract to deal with the new kinds of risks that we currently face, um, but we fail to put in place in many reasons because the debt has been continuing to run up and serves as a constraint. So while I would give the former president credit for actually surfacing a number of critically important issues and areas for the country to deal with, uh, not sure we dealt with them as well as we could have, but the important issues did come up. I'd say his record on fiscal policy 
uh, was nothing short of dismal, unfortunately. And I'm afraid that this has broken the cycle of kind of bipartisanship to deal with these issues. And, and there will probably be more of this to come unless we can kind of rejigger the way Congress uh, works. Thank you. Gunjun. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Stephen. And uh, great points from everyone. And uh, I'm Gunjan Sena, chairman of Metric Stream. We are one of the global leaders in risk management. And as I use the word risk, you know, when I look at the last four years, you know, there was a fundamental redefinition of how the world thought about risk in my mind. And it was a historic time because for the first time, you know, people had to now start valuing in those four years, you know, what is the real responsibility that you get by U.S. citizenship? You know, you get tremendous amount of privilege, but it also comes with a tremendous amount of responsibility. I think there was an awakening of that you know, what is the value of citizenship? And I don't care which side of the aisle were you on, whether you're Republican or Democrat, but you had to wake up to a realization that citizenship is an important concept and you have to deliver to your part of the bargain to be a good citizen and stand up for the rights. And I think that was the era because you look back at the last 50 years before that, there was a lull in the government. There was a certain amount of what I call political politeness or etiquettes or protocols or whatever else you call it. But last four years was a real awakening for people to understand and businesses to understand that they had to stand up for the future in their own terms. And government is not going to be there to salvage that. So I come from the world of business and I can tell you like businesses around the world now are taking real responsibility for ESG, environmental social governance, you know, because the issue of climate isn't just a political issue. It is an issue for the planet and there is no plan B if the planet runs into trouble. You know, we can't ship enough people to Mars and I know sitting here in Silicon Valley, we've got to do some, take some action. And it is really good to see that what Trump did in those four years, pulling out of, of the Paris Accord and all the discussion and debate that ended up happening has awakened the entire business community to take action. $40 trillion are going to float into the ESG oriented uh, uh, funds and investments and so forth across the globe. So that's an awakening that would not have happened if he hadn't shaken the tree, whether it was done by design or unintentionally, or it was just an artifact of what ended up happening. I don't really care. But what I do care is the actions that come from here. And Biden might write it and make that a, and have that as, as a central agenda. But I think the businesses around the world are now awakening that they have to take responsibility for the climate risk, as an example. But even social issues, businesses have awoken to the social issues fundamentally. For the first time, I see CEOs around the world making remarks on social issues like women empowerment, like, you know, uh, poverty or other kinds of things. There was a real apathy to these commentaries from the business community before that. But now sitting where you sit, the social issues are an issue, not just a political issue. It's for the Fortune 500 CEOs and CEOs of every size and shape around the country. That to me is an awakening that that has actually happened. So I'm looking at the goodness that came out of the four years is that there is an enlightenment in the business community to stand up for what they need to do and not just rely on the governments and the political machinery to deliver to the results. So companies have to learn to thrive on risk in, the, in, the, in my vocabulary as they think about it. He awakened the entire you know, apparatus with China. And the China issue is going to be not just a government issue, it's also a business issue. If I'm going to have a tremendous amount of my supply chain tied to China, and if I'm in the semiconductor industry with my few chips which are, which are being made in Taiwan or China, I have to think about how to diversify my third parties, my suppliers. And that's going to be a huge issue for companies to now reflect on. So a lot of the geopolitical things that happened in those four years have manifested itself into what I call underpinnings of how businesses are now reacting to the changing environment of risk and adapting to creating systems, processes, policies and governance that were never in the foundation of corporate America or even in younger startup innovative companies. So to me, there's a lot this legacy brings. And I think you're not going to see that apathy, which was there before 2016, that people were somehow OK. If you heard good speeches coming from Obama or George Bush or anybody else, and this is mine is not a you know, uh, political statement, but people were OK with that. Now people are looking for greater accountability as citizens of this country. So Biden has a tough ask here. You know, he has to deliver the next four years. And that's that's a good thing because you want to hold every political office accountable to what they have done. Trump went through his four year terms, could not get reelected. But I contend that Biden has to step up and deliver to the promises he has made 
And I know, you know, what what you mentioned, uh, Maya, in terms of the fiscal deficit, he's inherited something pretty ugly, you know, but he's got to still take responsibility and he'll be measured on what he did with that, not how he spends it and worsens the situation four years out. He doesn't stand a chance if he doesn't win the war against the, the trade war and the political war against China. There's a different issue. People will have it back four years from now. So I think that greater degree of accountability is, I think, fundamental. So when I look back at it, you know, 50 years hence, when we look back at these four years, I think this was a real awakening of America, the real awakening of U.S. citizenship and also U.S. corporate businesses to stand up and say, we are a friend for ourselves because government is not going to be there to fend for us the same way as we have known it. That's all, Stephen. That's right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Uh Professor Nye. Uh, I'm Joe Nye. I've worked in the State Department, Defense Department, intelligence community, but most of my career has been at Harvard at the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, when it comes to judging Trump's legacy, I have a chapter on Trump in the new book you mentioned, The Do Morals Matter? And what I say in that chapter is that it's really too soon to tell. Um, David McCullough, the presidential biographer, says it uses 50 years before you have a real assessment of the president's legacy. Uh, so we're guessing. But uh, we can start with the fact that Trump is totally different from any president we've ever had. Um, he was not only the wealthiest, but he also had the less experience, least experience. He, he started with the top job. He, he, he had no climbing up the ladder of learning. He just parachuted in at the top. And some of that showed. He was extremely skillful and had a big effect on transforming our, our domestic politics and the methods. Just like Franklin Roosevelt used radio in a new way and John Kennedy used television in a new way, Trump used uh, reality TV and social media in a totally new way to control the agenda. And what he did was transform the, the Republican Party from a conservative party, which believed in fiscal prudence and free trade, into a populist party. Now, you can be for or against that, but you have to admit that the guy did have a powerful effect. That's a legacy, for better or for worse. Uh, and in the process of that, it had a very strong polarizing effect on, on American politics. It contributed to it, and as the conservative columnist uh, Brett Stevens said, he created a no guardrails presidency. He sort of pushed the limits of what the norms were that guide the presidency. Now, if I look briefly at foreign policy, I would say that uh, Trump's legacy there is mixed. I agree with Frank of what he's done on, uh, on India and Indo-Pacific. I think he gets full credit for sort of waking us up on China, as Governor Gilmore said. Um, and uh, I think the, he was also quite prudent in his use of force. He didn't get us overextended. So I put that on the positive side of the ledger. On the negative side, though, I think he did uh, uh, undercut our alliances. He damaged us by pulling out of the Paris climate accords. And uh, most of the polls that have been done internationally show a considerable drop in America's soft power, the ability to get what you want through attraction rather than coercion and payment. So it was a mixed bag in terms of the legacy and foreign policy. So if we look ahead and say, how will future historians assess Trump's legacy? My guess is that it will be mostly negative. Um, I think that uh, he did have some strong effects at the time I mentioned, but I think the, uh, the negatives will outweigh the positives. Anyway, that's a guess because we won't know for a long time. Great. Thank you very much. And, and thank you all for the comments. So I've got a few questions here. We have uh, we have about 10 minutes left with the group here. Uh, we'll, tr we'll try to get to some of these. Um, I'd like to start with Maya. Uh, looking forward, uh, given the state of play in the U.S. government, the budget, uh, what are the strains that are coming on the economic system? Oh, it's a really interesting time because it's actually um, sort of the confidence. So we have these two big pillars, our two big systems of democracy and capitalism, and both of them are under strain right now. If you look at young people's support for both of them, they're not nearly as committed to either as, as we have been in the past. Um, capitalism is undergoing huge rethink and many questions and pressures stemming from the fact that income inequality, wealth inequality, mobility, economic opportunity 
all are sort of failing on the various metrics of what you'd want for a meritocracy to work. So there's a lot of questions about how to change the overall system. Um, but it's also going to be greatly complicated by the fact that economic growth in this country is going to be much slower for the coming decades, unless something tremendously positive happens with productivity or something else driven by demographics. So we have on one hand, a lot of pressure to change the way kind of the redistribution, the pre-distribution, the safety net and the economic system. And on the other hand, you have the greatest need for the strong incentives to help grow, to increase economic growth um, in any way possible. But I would add kind of this third element, which is technology is changing some of the basic issues inherent in capitalism, meaning that you need transparency and perfect information for markets to work. And what we have now is much more asymmetric information where many consumers know less about themselves than the purchasers of their data do. That means like things like consumer surpluses are going to disappear, which could lead to greater income inequality. And you have all these great risks with disinformation because markets basically function on trust. So I think many of the big themes that are going on um, as challenges in the country are actually putting capitalism under strain, but there's not yet any strong idea of what should replace it. And I'm worried um, that we shouldn't replace it, that we should be focusing on improving it instead. Uh, but it's one of the politicized and more polarized issues I think that we're going to see as a big trend coming up. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ambassador Weisner, uh, you discussed U.S. relations with India, Japan, uh, China, you know, brought up the revitalization of the Quad. How does the presence of the Quad impact President Biden's administration going forward? Well, I think uh, the Quad is a, a very important strategic framework to help focus American policy in the Asia-Pacific, in the Indo-Pacific, and it is a particular signal to China. So let me expand on that briefly and say that I think what the president has done in carrying forward a Trump initiative is to give it strategic direction, to sit down with our close allies and leave the door open to others in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and uh, in Europe, the British, the French have shown an inclination to cooperate with the Quad, to send a political signal to China that there is a community of nations that are prepared to come together when China oversteps the mark and to act in concert and to cooperate, not just militarily, not even politically, but the potential of cooperating in technology, in infrastructure development, of new basic strategic framework signaling China a determination that is really important with the direction to it. On the other hand, the <clears throat> um, intention of the president is equally to find a way to cooperate with China where there is grounds to cooperate. And he started by sending his secretary of state and his national security advisor to Anchorage to meet with the Chinese and put the issues on the table, figure out where we agree, where we disagree, and if there are areas of agreement in climate change or COVID uh, uh, pandemic control or uh, starting the global economy, then we should focus on those to create a strategic way forward. I hold the Trump administration at fault, not in standing up to China. That was important to compete and with China indeed, but not to deploy the tools of competition to build the alliances, and finally, to find areas in which we in China can learn to cohabitate. For in the end of the day, China isn't going to go away. We're not going to go away. We have to find a global order in which both of us can survive. Thank you. So that, that's interesting, uh, the, the things that he didn't do, or, or what people see. I guess what the public perception is they didn't do. Uh, Ambassador Gilmore, you had a unique inside perspective on President Trump's relations with Europe as, as his ambassador to OSCE. What was the policy you implemented at OSCE towards Russia, and how is that different from the public perception of the Trump approach? Well, I guess, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm listening closely to everybody. I'm actually learning a lot on this panel from the, from the, the people who are on the panel, and I'm, I'm particularly impressed with Frank's repeated point of signaling 
uh, because at, at OSCE, we've got, you know, 57 countries, they meet each week. You, you, you know, you, what's the point? And the point is that we're signaling. We're signaling to Russia how far they can go or they cannot go because they're quite aggressive. There's a new Russian imperialism, and it frightens uh, a number of countries uh, in Europe. Uh, it frightens the, Bal uh, the, the Bal Baltic states very much. It frightens people in Eastern Europe who are looking to um, America. And so the, the, the policy that we followed was to, to be strong and to state American presence and to straight state American strength and resolve. And you can do it through certain actions. For example, sending the Javelin anti-tank missiles. Uh, that's not going to win a war, but it does warn the Russians that they don't have a free pass if they continue to invade uh, these sovereign countries all across and around their periphery. Meanwhile, the allies were really looking to uh, the presence of the American diplomatic presence at OSCE to find out whether all this stuff that's being said about how America's withdrawing, more America's pulling back, America's new isolationism, they were looking to see what our diplomatic mission was doing. And what we were doing was cooperating fully and well with our partners, but also, uh, once again, asserting American presence in a strong way so that people felt comfortable carrying out their foreign policy and their national interests and in a partnership with us so that we could protect our national interests. And I think that that's really different from what we hear and what we see in the, in the, uh, uh, the popular media in the United States. Thank you. Uh, Professor Nye, uh, the United States is today existing in an international system largely evolved out of World War II and the Cold War. Uh, you know, much has happened in the ensuing time, often requiring consequential presidential decisions. And these decisions are often driven by an individual president's moral code. How does President Trump's morality compare to that of president since 1945? Well, uh, in the book where I look at all 14 presidents, he comes up near the bottom. Um, let's just take one case, the issue of lies and what you might call the legacy of lies. All presidents lie. In fact, all humans lie, for that matter. Uh, but if you look at the type of lie and the quantities of lie, it does make a difference what the quantity is. Fact checkers have said that Trump told 20,000 lies in his four years of office. Suppose that's suppose only half of that. When you tell that many lies, you debase the currency of trust. And it means... Bad part of okay, thank you. Um, Gunjan, yeah, as a successful businessman, you have to live with you know, President Trump's decisions on the economy, trade, jobs, investment, etc. Given that environment and the fact that business environment, you know, sometimes it responds quickly, sometimes it doesn't, is the business community doing enough to be successful? You know, and that's a very apt question. As I said earlier, I think the business community is kind of being galvanized into action perhaps seeing the inaction on the other side. Now doing it, they are beginning to take action. And it's action at all levels, including what I just talked about in the, in the world of ESG, environmental social governance, there's a complete kind of change of seeing here as businesses are now thinking about how to make their impact on climate change, for example. Similarly, if you think about cybersecurity, huge issue. You know, it's a national interest issue. And if you go back to World War II, 1945 Geneva Convention, that happened after the World War II. And it was, by the way, led by one Swiss national, I forget his name, it wasn't done by the governments, it was not done by United Nations, there's one Swiss national who did it, right? That's the kind of coalition that I expect that today, when you look at the future of war, for example, that's going to be a digital war. We're sitting in digital cybersecurity world, digital cryptocurrency, and disruption, the digital risks that are happening. So businesses have to start to create a platform which allows this to happen. So I'm beginning to see some of that shape taking shape from the likes of the you know, big technology companies, but also innovators like fintech companies and others who are doing this. So I feel there is a resurgence of approaches where government itself runs the risk of getting disrupted if 
they don't re-evolve into the place that we needs to be. So, so where I sit, you know, my advice to Biden would be they should do what, you know, DARPA did long back. They invested in something called the Internet. If you remember back then, DARPA, and that changed the world. My ask would be that you should be thinking about how to create a data layer to allow for all kinds of climate applications to be put around the world to save this planet and make this planet viable for the generations to come. And that will stir America into its new form because when I first came to this country, the internet drove the revolution. I think there's another revolution to be had here over the next 25 years, this time led by the climate and an, uh, and an initiative that can be led by the government, supported by the businesses. So okay. That's my ask. Thank you, Thank you very much. And uh, to the